Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us for the rescheduled Future Proof Artist Talks. Uh, my name is Rachel and I work at Street Level. I exhibited as part of uh, Future Proof in 2016 and also the Jill Todd Photographic Award in 2018. Future Proof is Street Level Photoworks annual showcase of photographic talent selected from across the Scottish degree show courses in fine art and photography. Um, it's been going since 2008 and apart from this year, the exhibitions are usually held at street level or our partner venues across Scotland. Uh, so this year we partnered with Source Magazine's BA Photography Platform um, and making our selection. This degree show has been held online this year. Future Proof is also held online um, and it's available to view on our website, which is uh, streetlevelphotoworks.org and it's in three parts. Uh, also, for the past two years, we've partnered with the Jill Todd Photographic Award, and um, we will be sharing more information on this uh, regarding this year's award uh, with you very soon. So tonight, you will hear from seven of the exhibiting artists, Annalise Davis, Alex Warner, Kia Fraser, Kirsty Robertson, Molly Lindsay, Ayushi Gupta, and Joe Haben. They will each give a short presentation, and at the end, we will hopefully have some time for questions, um, the q and so just leave them in the comments on Facebook and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So I'm going to just hand you over to Annalisa Davis, who graduated from uh, DGCAD in Dundee. Um, so I'm just going to pop myself on mute and you can take it away. And if everyone else just pops their cameras off as well. Thank you. Uh, yes, I graduated from uh, Duncan Johnston College of Art and Design. Um, I studied a BA on a uh, fine art degree and um, it was a four-year course and in the second year I learned how to use darkroom and um, other analog photographic processes including cyanotype, photography etching, liquid emulsion and black and white analog photography. And uh, most of the time, I like to focus on an area or a building I find interesting. I'm interested in history, telling a story, uh, structures within a landscape, um, either man-made or natural, uh, through images alone or images accompanied by uh, text. For each project, I either research a site first before going there or I come across uh, an interesting site just by chance. These photographs um, are, a are of a village hall in Dunning in uh, Perthshire. These photographs are not manipulated. They have been taken through a window of the building. I really like how the light streamed through the windows and the reflections created a magical, beautiful scene. Yet it was melancholy, just left derelict and used. Um, the dollhouse just gathering dust. The next images, um, these photographs are of um, the remnants of the mining community in Teesdale and in Weardale in County Durham. I find the history of uh, the British Isles really interesting. Um, these, the photograph on the left is a double exposure and the image on the right is a cyanotype. Uh, these next photographs um, are of, the image on the left is a photographier of Fingal's Cave, and the image on the right is uh, an image of Fingal's Cave, but it's um, a liquid emulsion of the basalt columns inside. And um, I'm really inspired by Norman Aykroyd and wanted to learn um, more about etching and printing. Um, and I love how Norman Aykroyd's images, they just look so, um, so atmospheric. And um, so I wanted to get into printing, but I wanted to keep in, within the realms of photograph and uh, photography. And I came across photographia etching. Uh, which I find really interesting, um, how it creates that um, the beautiful, kind of historical, magical feeling. Um, and uh, yeah, so 
when it came to the, um, I created my images for um, Fingal's Cave in the first semester of my fourth year. And um, in the second year, I mean, in the second semester, sorry, I wanted to, um, again, start a new project because I like taking more photographs and researching new areas and exploring the Scottish uh, countryside and um, areas. And a friend of mine in the second year, she told me about Crawford Priory, um, an old ruin where she grew up. And I always had it in the back of my mind of um, one day I'll explore it and uh, research it and find out about it. And um, I did, and it was beautiful, and it didn't disappoint at all. And I wanted to create um, really large scale uh, photographs. And I was wondering how to do this because large photographic paper is, ex is pretty expensive. So I came across liquid emotion and I just fell in love with it. It was, it was so expressive. You could do so much with it as well. And also you could create huge photographs um, at a quite a small price compared to if it was photographic paper. Uh, this uh, image to the left is 120 centimeters by 92 centimeters. I've included this image on the right just to show the, um, the scale of these photographs. Uh, this next image, um, these next images um, are also of Crawford Priory and it's 102 centimeters by 73 centimeters. In this image, I used um, not only liquid emotion, but also um, toners, um, including an, in, uh, an indigo toner. Um, I find um, liquid emotion so, um, like I said, expressive, and I've, re um, I've carried on using liquid emotion even now. Um, I've now, I'm now doing a, an MFA in Art and Humanities at GGACAD um, and I'm continuing with Liquid Emotion but I'm also um, looking at other analogue photographic ex, um, processes and just experimenting further and, um, and I'm, for this, uh, for my new project, I'm looking into um, COVID and um, Perth in particular. I live in Perth. Um, in Scotland and, um, and just the effects it's had on the town and on myself um, with lockdowns and I just thought I wanted to explore. Um, I'm living in history now, we're going to be talking about this in the future. So um, I didn't want to pass it by and not um, look into it and explore it. So um, that's what I'm doing now. Um, okay, that's my website, Instagram, and email address. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Annalisa. Um, I'm really interested in the alternative methods. Again, I said this last time, but um, it just feels like it's quite hands-on and experimental, and it looks really fun as well. Um, it's nice to see that uh, you're still doing more projects, and yeah, excited to see more. So um, I'll just go the next talk now, which is uh, Alex Warner, a uh, graduate of Glasgow School of Art. Um, yeah, I'll just pop myself on mute again. You can take it away. Yes, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, let me just put my PowerPoint on for everybody. Here we go. Come on. There we go. Hello. Hello, hello. Um, so I am Alex Warner, also known as Cool Cat Warner. And uh, yep, as Rachel said, I graduated from the Glasgow School of Art, um, studying fine art photography. Um, straight off the bat, I just want to say a massive shout out to my fine art photography uh, class. Um, massive shame this year, the degree show didn't happen, but I know that everyone's still working and still making work. And I really miss every single one of you a lot. And um, yeah, just want to say that. Um, but yeah, um, so I am an artist, maker, creator, photographer. Um, I like to draw, I like to make sculptures, I like to paint, I like to make a bit of music, I like to make clothes, I like to make zines. Um, I like to do a bit of everything really, a bit of it all. Um, but my work primarily, pardon the pun, primarily looks at primary colours and uh, looking at British consumerism 
um, and looking at modern life's rubbishness in a humorous way. So um, first off, I just wanted to show more what my studio was while I was studying and while I was doing these photographs, which is here on the left, on the left. Um, these, so when I, I the series toss um, originally was meant to be made into a zine. And when I make zines, I like to um, stick all the photos up on the wall and kind of pick apart and see what goes next to what and where, what should go where and how should go here and there everywhere. So as you can see, I've got, um, these are like portraits down here. These are series from like a fireworks, uh, firework night. And then these are me just slowly putting the book together. And then this whole desk is just covered in other photographs that was slowly going to be made into the book, which would, which is called Toss. And on the right, this is my studio bedroom set up uh, during lockdown. Um, during lockdown, I wasn't taking as many photos because as I'm sure everyone was just waking up and looking at the same stuff over and over again. So I got more into my drawing and um, I could only go to the only art shop that was open during the whole of lockdown, which was Poundland. So I had to use Poundland felt tip pens and Poundland paper and stuff to make these drawings and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's how my kind of practice and work had changed uh, during lockdown as well. Um, but we're here to talk about the photographs that are on the Street Level website, which are for, from my series called Toss. Um, the series is called Toss because of one photograph I took in the series in Blackpool. Um, there was a shop that was selling like Blackpool rock and stuff. And instead, and, um, I took this photograph of this one uh, cabinet in the shop. And instead of getting your mum's name or your friend's names nicely in a piece of rock, there was this big cabinet that had all these really like horrible words that you could get for your friends. So like you could get wanker, tosser, all these other things. And tosser was the one that kind of stood out the clearest. And I like the idea of toss being the name for this book because this uh, book explores um, me traveling up and down and around the UK, uh, looking for these kind of humorous in the everyday and looking at modern life's rubbishnessness <laughs> through, um, through uh, photography. Um, these photographs are um, half frame photographs taken on 35 color film. Um, I shot them all in a half frame camera. I've got a prop here. This is the camera I shot on, a Yashika Samurai. A brilliant little camera, this. I know it looks mad. So you shoot it that way or you can shoot it that way. So it looks more like a camcorder. Um, but um, yeah, which was really interesting, especially for portraits, because a lot of people thought you were filming. Or if I was at events, people thought I was filming and would get a bit argy-bargy about it. But um, yeah, if you want to get into half frame photography, I highly suggest this camera. I got it for a really good deal on eBay. And um, yeah, I love, I really appreciate and really like half frame photography. Um, because on a roll of 30, say on a roll of 35 uh, mil, um, 35 film, sorry, um, usually you would use the whole frame, whereas a half frame camera would put two pictures on one frame. So you're basically getting two for the price of one, which means um, instead of getting 36 shots on a roll of film, you're getting 72 shots. Um, it's basically a very cheap way to go about taking film photographs and having the photos there. But at the same time, it led to me Kind of having a lot more free range with the camera and a lot more free range with what I wanted to take photos of and I could take several photos from different angles of the same thing without feeling like I was wasting my money or wasting film um, but at the same time I was still able to kind of use all the beautifulness that film has. Um, of course the grain of the film you really want to use a high grain, grain of film and a high ISO film uh, to shoot these photographs uh, on a half frame camera as I said you're splitting the frame up in half. So you've got to be careful with um, how much you put in the image and stuff itself. But it leaves off a really nice aspect ratio as well, which I quite like. It's not quite rectangle. It's not quite square. It's kind of in the middle, um, but it still gives you a lot of room to play and prove with. Um, but right, let's get right in about it and talk about the photos. So this is, uh, so I have one of six photographs on the street level gallery. Um, this is the first photograph. I wanted to choose and talk about. Um, this photograph was taken in Blackpool. Um, this was on, uh, I went to Blackpool to go see my dad. Um, he lives in London and we went to Blackpool to go see a football match. Um, my team, our, our family team, AFC Wimbledon versus, as you can probably tell, Blackpool FC. Um, so it was easy for us because I was in Scotland, he was in London. We could just meet in the middle and hang out, which was a really lovely day out. Um, I went around the arcades just before I met him and played a couple of games and also took a couple of photos. 
as you do. And um, yeah, this photo really stood out to me. And also this game really stood out to me. Um, for me personally, it just kind of made a, uh, um, I wanted to conclude this in the series because um, a lot of my work also looks around the idea of nostalgia. And for me, this photo is very nostalgic as um, my dad used to drive, um, my, my dad used to have a motorbike growing up and I have many fond memories of sitting on the back of his bike, whizzing around London. And um, so I wanted to include this photograph of a motorbike helmet, this game. Um, also, um, a lot of my work, as I've said before, resolves, revolves around primary colours. And there's, um, you see some, you see a bit of aspects of the colours here in the balloons and then also around. And um, also, I, when growing up, um, I used to have a very similar Pac-Man kind of painting, Pac-Man painting around my room. Um, so yeah, so this kind of felt like a lot for me, a lot of nostalgia within this photograph um, and a lot of like kind of family Yes, and like the idea of homesickness, I guess, as well, because I got to meet my dad halfway in the middle of how far away we both live each other from each other within the UK. Um, so that's that's the first photo. Uh, second photograph. This is um, taken in Balak. Um, I'm going to get butchered for pronouncing like that, but this is taken in Balak um, in Scotland. Um, this is of my girlfriend's hand, um, and we are at Sea Life in Balak. Um, we went like literally just before closing we were the last people there and no one else was there so we were just kind of running around and I was taking these photos and things and um, Chrissy has the tiniest hands ever so I wanted to get I wanted to get this photograph of Chrissy's hand right next to a uh, Japanese giant spider crab um, just as like a contrast of the two and um, also before that day um, in the morning we went and got rolls and she got fried egg roll bit into it and it went all down her sleeve all the runny egg um, which is on the other side of her sleeve. Unfortunately, you can't see it in this photo. Um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, and um, the Japanese spider crab is just such a beautiful animal. Um, animal? Yeah, animal, I'm gonna call it animal. Yeah, and um, probably one of my favorites as well. I love crabs, I think they're great. I think they're just so funny looking. Um, so yeah, that's that photo. Uh, this photo was taken in London uh, in a market in Spitalfields. Um, this, this photo, well, especially the jumper just really stood out to me as um, the market seller clearly like put this on the front of his store wanting to get rid of it and wanted to be sold. But it's a, <laughs> it's a snowman without any eyes, which to me is pretty terrifying. And just this very cheeky, almost sinister kind of grin, just stare, like not even staring at you, like kind of staring at you in a way. Um, and yeah, I just found it quite funny how he put this at the front of his, um, his market stall. And I can imagine whoever won, whoever bought this jumper definitely won off the um, ugliest jumper competition at work. Cause that is, that is quite a standard that is. Um, so the third photo, what number are we on? We're on number four, we're on number four. Uh, the first foot flare, blah, blah, pardon me. Um, the fourth photograph is taken in Glasgow. This is of a van um, with the colors red, yellow, blue up in these bits, as you can see. Um, I kind of wanted to put this photograph Pardon me. Um, I kind of wanted to um, have this photograph in the series with the other six photos, just as a kind of nod to the rest of my work I do about primary colors, but also as a nod to what would have been my degree show uh, final piece, which was of, um, I, for the last three years, I've been taking photographs of red, yellow, and blue cars around Glasgow. And um, I was gonna display all these on the big walls in the uh, in degree show, and then also have remote control cars on the floor so that you could then drive your own remote, you could drive your own red, yellow, blue car while looking at red, yellow, blue cars in Glasgow and also drive your own car in Glasgow. Um, sadly, that wasn't, that didn't happen, of course, um, but still hopefully one day, one day hopefully we'll do that little show and do that series. But yeah, this, and also um, I just really loved the lighting in this um, photograph works really nicely and works really well as well. And um, yeah, I do a lot of, photography of cars and I really like cars so I wanted to kind of add this in the mix of the mix of these photos um, this photograph it was taken on Halloween on Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow um, so I wanted to do kind of like a series within a series in a way for this for this photo for this um, for the series of toss and um, this so this mini series is of me going up and down Sucky Hall Street on um, Halloween night in 2019 and um, I wanted to kind of take portraits of people dressed up and I wanted to get photos outside of clubs at three in the morning. Um, so I kind of wanted to get like photos of like Superman crying and like a witch eating a kebab or something. Um, so I went early in the night at like nine o'clock just as everything started to 
everyone started to go out and stuff and take some portraits and this is where i took this portrait um i i just really love this portrait i just think it's quite it's quite funny in itself um i love this little really tight little knot around his neck i can imagine probably his mate or his mum tied it just before he got on the train or went in the taxi or whatever and um yeah it's just he's a very innocent cheeky looking batman you know batman's usually quite sinister and deep voiced but he, there's some kind of like cuteness in this in, in this guy's face which i really love and yeah there's just quite a lot of innocence behind it it doesn't really seem like he's going to go and get smashed and drink five jaeger bombs it looks more like he is actually going to knock on doors and try and trick or treat <laughs> but yeah unfortunately um i did get quite a few good photos from that night i got some good photos of like a guy dressed up as elmo and things and some other ones um but sadly i didn't make it out at three myself because i was a bit too mangled but still i was going to do it this year as well i did go around the streets um, but obviously with it being in lockdown and with COVID, no one was dressing up and no one was going out. So sadly, they'll have to wait another year to carry on this series. Um, but yeah, that's, that's this photograph. And for my final photograph within the six is of a farm food shop window. Um, for me, this is, yeah, this is probably my favorite photograph in the whole of the TOS series of about probably like 50 or 70 photos. Um, to me, this photo is just quite funny as it reads, obviously, uh, close power failure. And um, but farm foods is the frozen food specialist and CCTV is in, in operation. So I'm imagining there's some CCTV footage of these poor farm foods workers running around the store, like chucking like ice cream tubs and spring rolls and stuff into bag, big bags of ice as everything stops melting. And they're probably like slipping and sliding around and all the frozen on, on the melting ice and everything. And um, yeah, I just imagine there's some really funny CCTV footage of all that, um, which, yeah, I kind of wanted this, this photograph to kind of, I know it doesn't look like much, but I wanted it to kind of like leave you to think and to kind of wonder what the, what is going on behind the, those locked windows, those locked doors, basically. Um, but those are my six photographs. But while I'm here, I thought I might as well plug um, some work I've got on right now at the moment in Glasgow. Um, I am currently showing work at the 24 hour window gallery, um, which is just around the corner, which is literally just around the corner, two minute walk away from street level, which if you're watching this, I'm sure you know where the street level gallery is. Um, this is my piece called Ryan Cone One. Um, it is 30,000 30, uh, red, yellow, and blue Ryan Cone stuck on a no waiting cone um, on a spinner with a light above it as well. Um, it is still on display at the moment with, with, with Glasgow being in tier four. Unfortunately, the lights and the spinner isn't on, but it will be on once we come out of tier four. And um, it is on display until the 18th of December. Um, so if you're about, go check it out. Um, if you're on a little walk or just want to see some art, go see it. It's in a shop window and it's great. And um, yeah, 24 hour window gallery is a great um, space to be showing work. And I highly suggest you go check them out. Um, but that's me for tonight. Thank you very much for having me. Um, if you want to see more of my work, go to coolcutwarner.com or go to my Instagram, uh, coolcutwarner. Um, yeah, massive thank you for having me, Street Level. Massive thank you for putting us on and um, stay tuned for the rest of these lovely talks. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Everyone stay safe out there. God bless, wash your hands. Uh, Black Lives Matter. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Pretty much, Alex. Uh, brilliant talk. Um, yeah, now you've got your website there, it reminds me. Um, I did have a, a wee scroll through it, and I think it's really uh, easy to navigate and really nice. It's a really nice website. I would, um, I would tell people to definitely check it out. And yeah, I just love your really upbeat, um, upbeat photographs. They're really, really nice. Um, they make me laugh, make me smile. And to hear you, uh, yeah, the stories behind them as well, obviously. Um, yeah. Cheer me up. Thank you. <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Thank you. See you guys. See ya. So next um, we have Kia Razor, um, another graduate from Duncan of Jordanson. And yeah, take it away. Hi, thank you, Rachel. I'll just get my PowerPoint up. Hope this is working. Here we go. So yeah, thanks Rachel. Um, I'm Kia Fraser and 
I am a DG CAD Art and Philosophy graduate and I'm a multidisciplinary artist living and from Perth. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with me. Pause that for you. Slow down a wee bit. Um, I mostly work in analogue photography, filmmaking and a little bit of writing. I don't know. And um, sorry, I'm just going to try and pause that. There we go. In my practice, I centre around the themes of every day. Sorry, I'm going to have to try and come out of this and come in again. Two seconds. Sorry about this, everyone. There we go. Maybe I'll just go, go with this. Okay, sorry. So in my practice, I sent around the themes of the everyday, archiving, the home and the amateur. And also the nostalgia that's kind of attached to all of these themes. Often I look at them together as well. So the everyday archives that feature in the home and the extension of the home by the amateur archivist. So onto that. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the analog uh, photography that features in Future Proof from the Decree show, given some of the background along the way. And the photos were shot on 35 millimeter and 120 medium format, and mostly using my granddad's Rolleiflex camera that I found in my granny's cupboard last year. Um, at the time, I had no idea uh, what it was capable of or its prestige as a camera. Firstly, I want to highlight a few of the artists that I draw inspiration of. So you might see themes um, coming through of a little bit of Suburban Sublime and Jeremy Hogan here um, on the left hand side. Uh, a little bit of new topographics like Stephen Shore in the middle there and uh, a little bit of Tish Martha's social documentary photography as well. So firstly, I'll talk about Scheme Sublime. Uh, this series is really the umbrella title for this work and it was the starting point, um, a play on Suburban Sublime uh, that I just mentioned there. And it was, uh, it has uh, plenty of mini series that branch off of it that I'll go, go through as well. So Scheme Sublime, uh, was really a visualisation of this rosy, glowy, nostalgic feeling of home and that feeling that I get between North Mountain and Potter Hill, the two schemes that I grew up in. Um, I think at the time, um, spring really helped make that rosy feeling come over and that was really important to me because I didn't want it to feel cold or harsh at all. So the two black and white images here um, feature in the exhibition uh, Future Proof and the phone box uh, was located at the local shops just around the corner but it's since been removed. Um, already nostalgia under, uh, nostalgic undertones sorry, are present here and the phone box, um, the terminus and the flats here shown um, where the trees housed our gang huts as kids and the flats uh, housed the sheds that we used to smoke in when we were younger. Um, let's move on to it. So Meet Me at the Grit, Grit Bin was one of the micro series that came off of Steam Sublime. Um, and it was really just a, a series playing homage to the old meeting place. So from a young age to our teens, this is where we'd arrange to meet our friends, uh, mostly because of its standout nature and the angle shape of it to lean on. Um, it latterly became our hiding place for things that we didn't want to get caught with uh, or our parents to find on us. Um, and even later on from that, a uh, place for our carry out for after the dancing. <laughs> um, Jaggy House is a literal observation of this common jaggy armour that our houses wear. Uh, the subject matter for this was so harsh that I just wanted to soften it up by framing it with the natural world, like the blossoms here or the bush in the bottom there, uh, or objects from my everyday archives, like this bike, which was um, raked out of my mum's attic for filming just before lockdown. Next up is the No Ball Game series, and this is pretty self-explanatory, this one, but mostly I was interested in their feature um, in playful landscapes and when I called the local council to get my hands on one of these signs for filming, um, 
They said that they had all been removed for Scottish government's play strategy. Uh, apparently, Scottish government called it the, them anti-play signs and ordered local councils for their removal. Um, so it became more and more obvious while I was taking photographs for the other series that this wasn't true. And so I scouted them out um, for this own little mini series and I'm actually still finding them today. So on the left here, someone did do their job, but it was probably a uh, Ma or a Da. And in the middle is one of the many that I found that deserves preservation, appreciation, and to be archived. Um, this photo, lastly on the right here, is the fort um, in Potter Hill, which was our old football pitch. It had bollards bigger than us, uh, and they were placed there to stop us playing, but we ended up using them as goals instead. Thank you. Um, I just want to say a huge thanks to Street Level Photo Works for this talk and exhibition and to Rachel Malcolm and John for tonight. Uh, to all the SAD grads this year and fellow talkers this evening, I have some copies of my publication. If anybody is interested, just give me a wee email. This is my email down here. And I've got uh, my Instagram handle there as well. And on that, you can find a link in my bio to the full picture full picture commission, uh, which was just released over this last week by Creative Dundee that I featured in. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kira. That was great to, to listen to. Um, there is that sort of nice feeling of kind of looking back at summer and like, being young, uh, looking at these pictures. So thanks for that on a horrible winter's cold night. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so next um, we have Kirsty Robertson, um, another graduate from Duncan Jordanson. Um, I will just hand it over to Kirsty. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen now. Sorry, just getting it set up. Okay, is that okay? Right, so as Rachel said, my name is Kirsty Robson. I'm from the Highlands of Scotland and I'm another graduate of DJ CAD and the infamous class of 2020. So um, I'll just be talking about my degree show work today. Um, so the project is called The House. And it kind of began with an idea of the concept of exploring how a photograph is usually just a photo of like a slice of time, like a time less than a second. So I'm really interested in how like an extended length of time can be captured in a single photograph. So the project is split into two series. Uh, part one is called The House. And I started this project by experimenting with double exposures as I can see is as two points in time kind of fused into one, but the materiality of film. Um, I've always wanted to try creating these manually with film and like winding back the camera and like reshooting it rather than superimposing two images. So I was kind of taking influence from past projects as I'd looked at like nature reclaiming urban structures in a very global and very like general sense before, but I wanted to photograph a place that was very like personal to me. So this is a house um, near to where I live in the Highlands and I've always gone back and like revisited it and kind of witnessed this like progression into like regrowth and also decay. Um, as these derelict houses, they're sort of very symbolic of like the ravages of time and how like time is also frozen. So you can see it like accelerated in like the peeling wallpaper, like the plants, the leaves inside, but also frozen as you see like kind of artifacts from this house, like old newspapers and like bottles and stuff like that. And I took the first exposures, um, I'll go into the next slide and see a couple more. So the first exposures I took were of the interior of the house. So I shot one whole roll of like the floorboards, like each room to room moving along. And then the second 
lot of photographs after I reinserted the film were of kind of the surrounding like fauna of like plants and trees and I really like how you get the sort of mix of the very like organic forms of like the plants and then the very like rigid structure of the house. And when I shot these I never really planned any sort of like image to line up with one another. I quite like just leaving it to chance and then seeing how it went. So yeah that is the part one. Uh, part two, um, kind of continuing this idea of like an extended amount of time being captured. I was kind of thinking of my own relationship with the house as sort of part one was very focused on the aesthetics of like the plants growing within the house. Whereas part two was kind of more my personal relationship to it and my sort of ritual of returning and kind of witnessing its like neglect and decay. So these are long exposure portraits, which I, it's a method I've kind of worked with before, but in a very sort of like in a studio and like it was kind of focused on just the face. So I really wanted to bring them out and like work like within its environment and like interact with the environment as you see in like the left hand photo. Um, and like, I love how these photographs, they sort of have a very like ghostly aesthetic. There's a couple more there. And this house itself, it's a very like in-between space because like, you know, like once this house had like memories attached to it, like from whoever lived there, but I just kind of wander in very much as like a spectator and like wander through the halls, but I'm never a permanent resident, which I quite like the correlation between that and kind of classic like supernatural tropes and like classic horror as well. So I'll show you this slide as well. So this series, like, like I said, it was going to be my degree show work. So I was thinking of like how these photographs were going to be shown. Um, so like in these portraits, it was kind of accidental. Like I never really planned to make a film out of them because I didn't realize until after like I developed on how well they flow as a series. So like starting from the top left, and then ending in the bottom right, you kind of see a figure appear, which is quite interesting. And like originally I'd planned kind of to show this sort of like very like short movements by using a carousel slide projector. But there was lots of like constraints with that, such as like these were negative, so I'd have to like shoot on positive film. And just thinking of where the slide projector would have fitted in to the degree show space. So I kind of in a way cheated like I usually work with analog film but I feel like modern technology is there to be useful so I kind of made a sort of hybrid film by editing these photos to have the classic like curved edge of a slide projector and I recorded sound from a slide projector the classic like clunking noise so you get the sensation of that was a very like old found footage and then show it digitally which works really well I think and as for these pieces, so I had the part one images of the double exposure and I was planning on making like prints out of those so you could really see the detail. And for the part two, I was going to have the film, but I was kind of thinking of how I could marry these sort of two series together and kind of bring the exhibition together. So I started to think about materials and like I wanted to branch out because I'd only ever really worked with paper and photography. So I like initially like like Annalisa, I worked with liquid emulsion on glass and perspect, but the process was like very temperamental working with that surface and it didn't come out nearly as half as well as Annalisa's did. So I started to think of fabric. And the thing I really want to be ambitious with this year was scale, which just wouldn't have worked with glass considering like how heavy yet fragile it is. So working with fabric, I really had something like silk or chiffon in mind, like something with a lot of lightness and like fluidity, which I felt really reflected the sort of nature of the photographs. And eventually I printed on microfiber polyester, which was a hell of a lot cheaper to print on, but I feel like it got the elements um, of the silk and chiffon, which I wanted as in an exhibition, these could be viewed potentially like through one another to create an almost like triple or like 
quadruple exposure, which I felt fitted in quite nice. And when they're hanging, they tend to have a lot of movement to them as well, which I feel, especially with the figures, worked really well. And it was really interesting to seeing like the aspects of the house, like the window in the bottom right there and like the door in the top right, like blown up and the figures as well to like human size. Like I find it was quite immersive, which I really wanted to go for, for my degree show, just try lots of new different things. And um, hopefully I'll get to um, like show these one day in the way in which I planned. But as it turned out, I was back home in the Highlands during lockdown. Um, which I never had planned to be at that time because I was expecting like to be in Dundee working in the studio but like having to go back there for lockdown I got to like document these back in like their place of origins like back in the house and back in, in the surrounding woods so you can kind of see them influenced by the elements which um, worked out pretty well <laughs> it was one of the very few like positives of lockdown so I was very pleased with that um, so yeah, that's pretty much just a couple of bits from my degree show. Um, just want to say a big thank you to Street Level for having me and I hope you all enjoyed the exhibition as well. Um, my links to see, like if you'd like to see the video, there's a link to my video on my website. And um, yeah, my Instagram's there as well. And I hope you enjoyed the exhibition and the rest of the talks. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, um, I mentioned last time that your work really reminded me of uh, Francesca Woodman's. Um, just wanted to say that again. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, um, she's more of like my oh, main inspiration, so I was. It's kind of like an ode to her this series because she's like was the one that got me into photography at the start. So a little love letter to her. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's great to see that the work you've actually gone and installed it as if you would have had a degree show. It's nice to see that you took that step further. Um, and I think the the sheets and the material and the and the woods is just lovely, oh, really nice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on. Um, next we have Molly Lindsay, a graduate of uh, Glasgow School of Art, and um, I'll just hand it over to you, Molly. Hello. Um, I'll just get up my presentation for you. So yeah, um, I just want to check that everyone can see that okay, yep. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm gonna, I've chosen to talk about two of my graduate projects. Um, so I exhibited the project on the left there, um, Traces in Future Proof, but I just thought it'd be kind of interesting to show how my use of like the red line has sort of trickled into another one of my projects, um, which didn't really get to get finished because of lockdown, um, which is called Uses of the Erotic on the right there. Um, and yeah, like more recently, I've been sort of showing the two projects together. Um, like retrospectively, I think looking back on them, I've noticed that they are both about completely opposing themes, but yeah, I still, they're still connected by this red line, but the red line is used for you know, completely different purposes within each project. Um, so I'm going to start off with traces. And um, this is, this project was um, all about the idea of wanderlust and um, kind of looking at the artist as a voyager, sort of breaking out, being able to break out of the confines of the studio in order to make work. Um, and using the landscape as, as a canvas. Um, I traced my like sections of, of the path which I walked, um, like using the line to sort of mark my path. There we go. So yeah, I, the, I decided to attempt to walk the West Highland Way, um, which is a hundred mile sort of path that goes across the West Highlands in Scotland. Um, and I really wish I could say that I did the whole 100 miles for this project, but it was very difficult. It was midwinter and um, I got caught in blizzards and there were, you know, like two feet of snow at different points. So I had to sort of do it in different sections. Um, 
but I did later on like more recently I went back and I did walk the whole thing so I did get the full experience of walking um but yeah so the yeah so the name traces basically comes from this like idea of, of like tracing your steps along a path um then I said earlier about how you know like I couldn't I wanted to go out and hike do this big hike or like by myself and make this work but it was just too difficult it was quite scary at points and this sort of became part of the concept um in some of the images the red lines kind of allude to like hunting tracks and I like this idea because it's sort of I feel like this the feeling of or the experience of being feeling like you're being hunted whilst you're walking alone is something that I think a lot of women especially could relate to um and then also to get across this idea of fear and isolation in the wilderness and walking alone I photographed like quite dark sort of figurative um figurative shapes in nature along with the the kind of red paths that I was tracing yep so then red line continues into the next project uh, uses of the erotic which is about desire um yeah, so I named this project after an essay by Audre Lorde um and so she in her essay she sort of describes the erotic as this deeply spiritual and female thing which has been completely misnamed by the society and the media and um she sort of urges her reader to reclaim a sense of what that word means um so i wanted yes yeah, so my the, the kind of imagery in this project was uh, meant to be sort of a visual response to to her words um yeah so in order to do this i photographed intimate but also staged acts of dressing um and the idea behind this was that traditionally women are depicted as undressing so I wanted to do the opposite and capture photographs of you know or capture the act of becoming clothed and and see if this could be perceived as erotic as well uh, so this is an image from my research um, when I was editing the images and this is a kind of my process of storyboarding um, um, I was kind of looking, also making use of like shadows and lace and noticing the sort of similarities between shadows and lace and how they are erotic and how they kind of allude to something being there, but also not, they're sort of suggestive of something being there. Um, and the same as with kind of the way I've storyboarded these images in kind of a cinematic way but leaving gaps between the images like before and between kind of leaves up to the imagination what's going on in between whereas I guess in the moving image you don't have that aspect of imagination kind of uh, to decide for yourself what's happening in between the pictures yeah um, and then in this image I photographed um, the act of of putting on a belt and I was thinking about the sort of the connotations of the belt as well um, and also I was also thinking about androgyny in this one um, like her face isn't quite I've just kind of revealed that it was a woman but um, yeah just thinking about androgyny there um, and then I'll explain how the red line came into play in this project. This is a picture of uh, the contact sheet from my research um, when I was editing the images. Um, and I decided to reapply the red lines that I used in the contact sheets onto the final images. I did this because at the time um, we were doing a, I, I was 
preparing the works for a work in progress show and that was sort of like after Christmas but but pre pre lockdown um so to, I wanted you know to show that these were still works in progress um, and that's why I reapplied the red edits onto the final images which you can see an example of here and um, but then obviously lockdown happened not that long after so I quite liked I quite liked that you know the images are now kind of eternally works in progress and I think if lockdown hadn't happened then the images themselves would have taken a totally different direction and um so it's, it's interesting to think how yeah how it how they've how they've um yeah what direction the work's taken because of lockdown um and then finally uh, i just thought i would share with you another way how that i've continued to develop the work um so this is a, a gum bichromate print um so i i decided to start this was like a week a week before lockdown happened i think um i started getting into alternative processing um i really wanted to get across this idea of skin in the image but also like skin on skin contact within the production of and the printing of of the image itself of the object um so i chose to work with with gum bicromate, which is a really traditional uh, photographic printing method. Um, it's very, very tactile and delicate, like hands-on process. Um, and it also really worked because it's one of the few processes where you can add, you can just choose your color. Um, so it really worked with, I was able to use red, you know, to still keep in with that idea of, of the contact sheet and these images always being sort of a work in progress or an exploration of my of my theme yeah so I think I think that's everything I have to say yeah. that's great Molly thank you really interesting um talk um I feel like there's a lot of like movement in your projects like with um you know your walking and uh, like the storyboard images as well so the sort of idea of like a continuous work work in progress it's like a it's like a journey so it's really nice to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, so second last talk for for tonight with um, Ayushi Gupta, a graduate of um, Edinburgh College of Art. Um, so I'll just invite you to um, to begin. I'll just put myself on mute. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I'm just going to share my screen as well. Um, so, uh, hi everyone, my name is Ayushi, um, and I did the, I, I, I study photography at the Edinburgh College of Arts. Um, I want to thank uh, Street Levels for inviting me here, and I know COVID has been, um, uh, you know, uh, obviously very uh, challenging for a lot of us, but I do want to say that if it wasn't for COVID, then we would all be in the gallery, which I know we all really want to do, but uh, that would have meant that my family would not have been able to watch me actually present this. And I just want to give a shout out to my family and friends who are joining me um, today because um, they have been a very important part of my journey. Um, so the series of images that I will show you today are um, the culmination of a project that I worked on uh, during my final year um, at Edinburgh. And um, I, uh, I, I, before I began the project, I, 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 I did an artist residency in Berlin, and I was already thinking about what, what, what kind of themes I wanted to do, what kind of, what, what I wanted to work on in my final year, and I knew I wanted to do something with self-portraiture, I, I wanted my work to be political, um, but I was still struggling to find exactly what uh, to target. Um, or investigate. And when when I was in Berlin, I felt in, in a very sort of liminal state because I was in a completely new country um, for three to four months, uh, fast paced, slow paced, depending on how you look at it. And I um, started thinking about um, 
my own my own political identity particularly um i was reflecting on how um i've sort of always moved um uh places um so i'm 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 in uh, i'm an overseas citizen of india i was born in india but i grew up in the uae um and i studied for most of my life in the uk and i usually travel um, to Europe or to North America. And each of these things, they come with a certain temporary status, which, which, um, which was what I was reflecting on quite a lot uh, during my time in Berlin. Um, and so uh, I, I realized that um, uh, a common thread that connects each of my temporary statuses is, is the bureaucracy um, of travel, immigration, and identity protocol that I um, constantly undergo to validate my statuses. Um, and various sorts of bureaucratic documents, such as passports, passport photos, visa and residential cards, and increasing piles of official papers. Um, I, I must say, bureaucracy does teach you um, how to uh, archive and carefully catalog all your all your papers um, but you know the, these these I found that they these documents um, manifest and define uh, my official identity without actually considering the diversity and the complexity of uh, its nature so I found that I was one thing on the paper but I was questioning whether I am that thing and what kinds of um, rights and relationships define what I am on paper and what I'm not, uh, what I am off paper. Um, so um, I, I found that these documents, you know, uh, are they constantly standardized and uh, homogenized um, all, all sorts of people's identities um, into um, categories of um, gender, age, and nationality. And I, I decided to focus on this. I, I thought that this would be the political angle that I would like to uh, investigate and explore with my project. So the project is called Performing the Passport Photo. Um, and I was drawn to uh, uh, exploring the passport photo because I think it is probably one of the most heavily regulated types of photographs. And, it's, and it shares its history, political context, and bureaucracy baggage with other similarly regulated images such as uh, mug shots but also images um, that um, were produced uh, uh, during uh, as part of eugenics experiments can't remember the name of the person I think it was Francis Dalton um, so I, I thought you know the, the passport photo sort of sits in this history of uh, extremely regulated kinds of standardizing um, images um, um, involved with uh, huge networks of sociopolitical systems like national ID key, uh, national ID schemes, that is particularly in the case of passport and ID photos, but also law enforcement and travel and immigration protocol. It seems like these, especially the passport photo, I mean, the mugshot, mugshot photo appears uh, just in, uh, you know, uh, law enforcement uh, networks, but I think the passport photo, we, we tend to use it in, in everything, you know, university documents, um, your, your immigration documents, but also any kind of file that you're fi filing, just bureaucracy is, is uh, embodied in, in, in a passport photo. Um, so, as I said, I began working on this um, project uh, in Berlin, and uh, one of the challenges that I posed for myself in terms of my process was to try and produce images without actually using a camera. Um, and my solution was to uh, photograph myself in photo booths that were used for different purposes. So initially I was interested in exploring the history of photo automats in Berlin. Um, but then I grew more and more fascinated by passport photo booths in particular, um, the, the passport digital photo booths as you see um, on on this uh, on this slide, Photofix, which is a, a million million pound company now, and it's got an interesting history there as well. Um, so I was really in, interested in sort of looking in um, exploring the kind of liminal and transitional spaces that we find passport photos in, um, like airports bus and train stations, but also I was drawn to the illustrations, if you see on this slide, um, 
of passport photo rules and regulations in these booths and these appear sort of you know in various kinds of photo booths that you with a photographer if you go and uh, take your um, passport photo so I try to um, I try to mimic the uh, these images I try to sort of perform uh, the rules and and um, and try to uh, protest these rules that I will uh, return to later um, so I, as I said, I will produce the illustrations and the images uh, that the boots would generally generate. So this is a, uh, a passport photo card that you would get uh, from one of these boots uh, from the PhotoFix Passport Center. And I, um, I, just, I just try to uh, recreate that and, and sort of replace it with a, an image, um, this, this, this particular uh, passport photo actually I don't really think it complies with the rules of passport photos today but I, I took this in the in the studio um, playing on this idea of you know um, sort of subverting or protesting the rules in in their conventional formats um, and yeah my intention in transforming this uh, banal object which is this sort of photo card was to present it as an uh, art object and comment on the notion that differences in official regulations between nations. So for instance, you know, um, the UK uh, would have different sort of passport photo rules to uh, the UAE, to Europe, to the US, and they are, they are different. Um, and if you, if you go and have your passport photo taken, people will usually ask you, where are you applying for a visa to, and they would take your images according to that. And so I wanted to comment on how these differences in official regulations between nations tend to trap foreign individuals in a bureaucratic cycle because you know we go to we go from door to door just trying to get the right thing um so i build on this um i uh, i find that our compliance um with passport photo rules and broader bureaucratic procedures seem to be a performative act um self portraiture itself is you know has has a theoretical um history of being self performative, uh, sorry, performative. And so I, I kind of try to draw a parallel between, uh, you know, performing, complying with the rules and performing for the camera as kind of seeing it as, are we just performing um, any kind of official identity for rules? Um, and so I, I think I kind of, you know, in, in with this, with these series of images, particularly, I wanted to sort of um, highlight that perhaps the way we comply with bureaucratic procedures is a performative act wherein we're not even actors but rather puppets that stage some sort of official identity that has been given given to us in in the sense as if i was to i can keep my name because it is on paper but if i was to change my name i would still need to have a paper and we kind of perform these rules and our identities are officialized without really our i don't know i guess you could say interference but perhaps not um, and yes, like I said, there are, you know, parallels that can be drawn between the, the theatricality of the stage performance and, and the photographic act. Um, and we have also, we have kind of, you know, if, if you have uh, gone for uh, to have your passport photo taken, you kind of see yourself performing, literally preparing for the photo, you know, fixing your hair and um, checking if your face is all clear. Um, sometimes you have to take your glasses off, but all these sort of things that you kind of prepare yourself to get into character, um, which is what I wanted to uh, really uh, highlight in, in, this, in this series of images. Um, this is a like a, a, like a pre-stage of uh, one of the works that I finalized. Um, and um, I, my project at this stage really became a means for me to establish my agency and introduce a human element in the very standardizing and bureaucratic procedures of which the passport photo is a defining element. Um, so I attempted to uh, protest the bruteness, uh, bleakness, and frontality of the passport photo, thereby challenging uh, the systematic framework that regulates the constant production, circulation, and consumption of this image. Um, so in this work, I try to um, really uh, satirize the passport photo guidance form that I um, have sourced from the UK Home Office website. And I use the UK Home Office because you know it, it is the immigration system that I have been in contact with for the last um, few years of my life. Um, 
And, uh, and in this week, I, I wanted to foreground, I guess, the institutionalized aspect of photography. Uh, you can really see the images with the rules and it's sort of really, you can, you know, you can see it, that the images um, kind of uh, validates the institution that it is a part of um, and sort of drives it. Um, and I wanted to examine the use of uh, the passport photo as a, an apparatus of a larger sociopolitical system like immigration. Um, and post-production, so when I was actually converting these initial images on the, on the left-hand side of my screen uh, into passport, si passport photo-sized images, I realized that um, you know, uh, there was something really interesting happening there. And I guess you know, it's the virtue of process because um, I, that this sort of production stage helped me realize this work um, in which um, I wanted to critique the controversy surrounding the use of religious covering. And I think this, is, uh, this has been a controversy uh, in, uh, in, in France, but also I like how certain um, parody religions, you know, have an interesting take on this. Like, I think, I don't know, um, but I, there is a parody religion called um, Pastafarianism or the spaghetti flying monster. And, you know, people following that religion try to, uh, um, really uh, protest that they wanted to have their ID photos with a with a colander on their on their heads. So I wanted to sort of uh, play with that uh, in in these works. Um, and these these the next series of images that I will show you, um, I I've, I've been told are probably the most interesting aspect of my project, but I've only uh, presented them as a work in progress. Um, I, um, they're in untitled um, and I was, um, yeah, I was still working on these images. Um, the, the, the really, the idea was to just go into the studio and, you know, bring a backdrop down, which I actually, um, yeah, bring a backdrop down and just not plan what materials I'm going to take with me, but use what I find and just sort of write uh, what I think about um, or, yeah, it, like, think about my experiences of, of bureaucracy. Um, um, one of the themes that I had been thinking about as well when they developed my project was, was the anxiety that people feel when they travel through airports, especially, and travel through sort of like uh, immigration checks, but also, you know, being interviewed. Um, and I really wanted to sort of uh, uh, push myself to think about these things and materialize them on, on, on paper. Um, so um, I, I feel like these works um, are actually constantly in progress. So this was my first attempt at the performance. Um, and uh, then I attempted it again for a second time. And I think, yeah, I think these works are um, an open-ended dialogue, um, something that I could potentially return to, but I feel like no, ma no matter how many times I return to these works, they would ultimately remain unfinished because I think um, what I write on the background will change with my experiences of, um, of, of the bureaucracy of immigration itself. And, and you know, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem like that's, that's something that I will stop dealing with in the near future of my life. So, um, so I find these works are in progress and I guess I've reached a stage where I didn't really know how to how to turn, how to stop working on these images. Um, and I, I, I had this thing of constantly returning to them. Um, but yeah, um, I'm, I guess I'm going to leave, leave it at an open-ended dialogue. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Aisha. Um, yeah, I think it's a great project, um, you know, dissecting the routine of uh, the passport photo. Um, yeah, it's a really important subject, and I think you've shone a light on it perfectly. Um, still kind of lighthearted as well, so quite easy for people to, to digest. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. So on to our final talk for this evening. Um, Joe, Haven, yeah, thank you very much for waiting uh, patiently. It's all um, right. <laughs> from Glasgow School of Art, so I'll let you just get on with it then. Thank you. Uh, two seconds, just share my screen. How do you share your screen? Oh, there it is. Can you see that? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so my name's Joe. Um, I'm a graduate from 
going way too quickly already. I'm a graduate from GSA, uh, Glasgow School of Art, where I study communication design and photography. Um, the talk I'm doing today is about In Maleka, which is my graduate project. Um, it's going to read a short, uh, going to read a short paragraph about the project. Yeah. Uh, so Imeleka documents the events and effects of the Aqua Alta high water, which transpires annually in the city of Venice, Italy. This tidal activity is a natural occurrence, however, in recent decades has been exacerbated by the effects of human activity. Mass tourism, global warming, urban expansion and industrialization are damaging factors which have influenced the deterioration of the Venetian lagoon. These issues have led to the increasing tide and subsidence of the floating city. On the 12th of November 2019, tides reached 187 centimetres, submerging 85% of the city in water, nearly reaching the unprecedented record of 194 centimetres of the infamous Grande Alta, which took place in 1966. A controlling hold over the city, mass tourism brings 30 million visitors to Venice every year. A local I spoke to mentioned that they'd been asked on multiple occasions where the exit was or what time Venice closed, with some likening it to a theme park. The cruise ship industry poses a great threat to Venice with around 600 entering the lagoon annually. It's estimated that one cruise ship pumps the equivalent to 1 million cars worth of emissions into the water and air in a single day. These have a devastating impact on the lagoon's ecosystem and the underpinnings which support the city. Tourism nonetheless is not the root cause. System change is needed in order to tackle climate change, a saying that resonates among local activists opposing the issues in Venice. Exploring issues caused by human intervention, this ongoing project is concerned with highlighting the tender balance between urban inhabitants and the environment. Venetians have coexisted with their surroundings since 421 AD. In Maleka aims to question how cities like Venice can harmonise this interdependent relationship and adapt to the age of the Anthropocene in an increasingly globalised world. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I became aware of this of the aqua alta um when i was writing my dissertation uh last year my final year um i was doing a dissertation about public space and the aqua alta came up in in discussion about how the, how venice's streets and the city is transformed uh during this season um and i found it just I, I was just kind of fascinated that i wasn't aware of this already and not really anyone else I knew was aware that this was an ongoing issue. Um, and climate change obviously being a very topical thing. Um, I just thought it was interesting how it's quite a disputed topic within the right wing media and sort of is, is claimed to be false or non-existent. And I thought that the, a lot of my work kind of looks at looks at environments and objects and how you can kind of I can communicate issues or subject matter or uh, like emotions or content context sorry through through physical environments and I thought this was a perfect way of communicating climate change and and, and its existing scars and clearly evident uh, effects on the city of Venice um, so my first trip uh, I start. I, I was actually sitting in the library one day, uh, writing my dissertation, and it came up on my on my newsfeed that the the the, the most recent aqua alta had happened. Um, I had no money at the time. Uh, luckily, I'm privileged enough, privileged enough position that I could call my brother up and uh, get him to lend me a few hundred quid. <laughs> and I had to, I flew over the the next day um, and went on to document the devastating impact of the floods over there uh, over three days. Um, I stayed in a hostel on the mainland um, and lived off the breakfast buffet, which I smuggled out in a Tupperware every day, which I really <laughs> ate for breakfast, lunch and dinner whilst I was going around documenting everything. Um, and my camera broke halfway through. So luckily I had a digital backup. So which is why some of the photos are in digital, some of them are medium format. Um, yeah, so I, I, I shot that. I shot the, I shot what was happening. Um, I'd done some research before I went. Uh, I tried to get into contact with some local activist groups. Uh, one of them, which was called Venice Calls, and they were actually doing a cleanup of uh, the impact and uh, the debris and 
as you can see, of, as, of what had been left in the aftermath. Uh, but I couldn't get through to them, so I, I'd kind of uh, explored the city and, and documented what I could whilst I could, um, and then came back and researched more and contextualised what I was doing. Um, and then arranged to go for a second trip. Uh, so I looked up when the carnival was, which is the most popular and most busiest time of year in Venice, which is uh, when the whole city's, uh, they had the masquerade and events and festivals and all sorts. Uh, and went, went to that and I'd got, I'd got into in touch with some, I'm just going to pause this for a second because I'm going to start talking about stuff that's not on screen. Uh, uh, where was I? Uh, so I went for a second trip um, and whilst I was there, the coronavirus outbreak happened um, and the whole city went into lockdown. Um, and it was uh, pretty devastating, another devastating thing to happen to Venice. Um, and uh, we had to leave. I went back to quarantine um, at home for two weeks and kind of fought over the project. Um, I've just missed a huge part, chunk of what I was talking about. Whilst I was there on my second trip, um, I got in, in touch with some uh, local activist groups, managed to get in touch with them finally. Uh, one of them being uh, Comitato no Grandi Navi, who uh, opposed the cruise ships which entered the lagoon. And I interviewed them, uh, which was really beneficial experience. And they were very welcoming to me, which is nice of them. Um, and kind of put me in touch with other, other groups who are dotted around Venice, who are all kind of looking at sustainable ways of uh, solving these issues and whatnot. Um, I backtrack to where I was. Uh, whilst I was there, the coronavirus outbreak happened um, and we had to, had to leave. Um, um, and yeah, this had, a, this had a devastating impact on Venice specifically because the whole the economy of the city is completely dependent on tourism. So once the once flights were cancelled, once Airbnbs, hotels, and stuff were shut, locals are they're, they're because tourism has taken such a big uh, hold of the city. Once the tourists are gone, the people's income is mainly gone. Um, which was, I think. Well, the locals were already aware of that, but I think for the world, it was more of an eye-opening experience. Um, and I'm sure you all saw photos from, of online of the city and it was completely deserted. Um, but over time, um, you could see, well, there's lots of photos shared online about the, the quality of the air and the quality of the water in the lagoon uh, cleared up, which was miffed to be that it was the pollution leaving the water, but it was actually the sediment which is swept up from the, from the, the base of the canal. Um, and once that settled, you could actually see the ecosystem which was thriving underneath the water um, in the absence of all the boats and Vaporetti and the cruise ships. Um, this is an aerial view of Venice before, uh, the top is before coronavirus and this is during. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, cruise ships were cancelled uh, during coronavirus as well, which had a massive impact, a, a beneficial impact to the ecosystem. Um, and there was great news for a lot of the local activists which are opposing everything that's going on. Um, and this is this here is uh, called the Mose, I hope I'm pr pronouncing that right, uh, which is a seawall which has been built at, at the mouths, all the mouths of the lagoon, which has been being built. It's quite a very controversial project, which started being built in 2003 and has six, had six billion, I think six billion pounds put into it um, and was also involved in an Italian uh, corrupt, corruption embezzlement scandal um, where millions of pounds are being skimmed off the top. Uh, and it's also controversial because 
it's a short term solution to a long term problem. So when the when the tides rise in 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 the lagoon, these sea these sea gates, sea walls are meant to come up and prevent the waters from rising. However, the lagoon's ecosystem thrives from the passing of fresh water of the lagoon to the seawater of, well, of the ocean. Uh, and with these sea gates up, well, over time, with climate change and the sea levels rising, these these well these gate these the sea wall was was designed in 2003 and didn't take into account that sea levels would rise. So when sea levels do rise, the gates aren't going to be high enough to keep the seawater out. So are always going to have to be us kept up, which means the fresh water and the seawater won't mix anymore, um, which would basically kill the kill the lagoon um if i'm correct um these are some organizations i thought i'd put up here on groups which you should do some research into um if you want to um a few of them i have been in touch with and i hope to continue being in touch with and, and hopefully work with in the future um but since uh graduating uh, I've, it's, it's a bit of a shit time, uh, <laughs> to be frank. Um, so I've just been putting, we were meant to have a degree show, obviously, which that, which got cancelled. So I've been putting a lot of my effort and trying to make the most of a bad situation and applying for competitions and awards and stuff like that. So when I got back from Venice after the coronavirus outbreak, I put my photo here up onto something called the COVID-19 archive by uh then there was us magazine um which was a free thing to submit to and if any photographers are still taking photos of uh coronavirus then you can upload it for free um and from here my photo got picked up by cnn uh which is crazy and put in an article about taking photos during coronavirus um and then recently been featured in intern magazine uh people sphere creative review and recently uh, been selected for Earth Photo, um, and my work will be featured in uh, the National Forestry England for uh, sites in England, I think, there's three sites, which will be really nice to see a physical exhibition, uh, contrast to all the online stuff that's going on at the moment. And recently put in Portrait of Britain, which is crazy. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, big shout out to my brother, and my mum and dad, who are the biggest grasses I know. Uh, shout out to Sad Grads, shout out to Condes Photography. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, another really relevant and important topic, and you've clearly researched it very well, and it shows and the images are were great. And the fact you were in Venice when the virus broke out, uh, I guess one positive is that you managed to document a really rare uh, moment in time. So mm. uh, well done. Thanks a lot. All right, so that's all of our talks. Um, we will be now moving on to the Q&A. So if I want to invite all the artists just to maybe pop the uh, cameras back on, um, and we can all gather. <laughs> so there is quite a few um, questions here. I just have to slowly sort of gather. There's a couple of questions for everyone and there's also a couple of just observations from the audience so um if you guys want to say anything to each other um about your work or any observations between each of your projects um i'll invite you to do that first um but if not i can just jump straight into some of the, the questions for you guys um, um i was gonna ask kaya as the, the no ball games project you did i really like that um and i was wondering as a project, you mentioned how it was really interesting that they'd been left up. Would you, would, are you wanting to keep them up or are you wanting to like take them down for yourself and keep them as sort of as like artifacts or keep them up there as like relics? There's definitely a few that I want to have <laughs> uh, that I've, I've kind of got my eye on. Um, I'm not too sure yet. I, I, I've been toying with that obviously going on like in lockdown and going on like our daily walks and stuff like that I kept finding more and more and the temptation while nobody was about and it being so quiet to to just 
you know, take some tools and try and remove them <laughs> was was quite high at that time. Uh, now that that's kind of passed, um, yeah, I don't know. There's some that's definitely worth archiving um, and some that I think will just remain in like photo documentation of. Um, and there's some that are already kind of in between these two stages as well that um, I'm not sure what to do with yet. There's on my Instagram actually, there's one that's always really soggy and uh, one day I'm just really kind of waiting for a day that is going to be like dry because it's, it's, you know, it's got probably just hanging on by like one screw <laughs> on the side of this wall and uh, I think it's, it's too tempting to not take that when it's, it's not so soggy. Um, I was also going to ask Molly, um, with the red line in your work, was, I don't know if you, I don't know if you, I didn't hear you mention, uh, was it like a conscious or like a subconscious decision of you passing the red line on through the two works and do you draw a much, do you draw a lot of connection between the two? No, um, yeah, no, it's interesting that you asked that because uh, it wasn't conscious at all, like it wasn't until... Uh, you know, like quite recently, because the projects were done quite like a fair bit of time apart. So yeah, it was completely unconscious. It must have just been, yeah, it was just relevant it, to both projects, but in completely different ways. It wasn't at all planned, but then that must, I think it's something that I will continue to now consciously use and develop in my work for like, I feel like it's interesting how like a, a red line can be used in so many different ways. So I'm excited to, to use it in the future and see what other sort of connotations it has and other uses it has. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Thank don't, you. don't use yellow and blue or Alex will come after you. Yeah, no, I'll stay away <laughs> from the other primary colors. I'll just stick to, to red. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually had linking from that. I had a question for um, Ayushi. Um, just because I noticed that you also use the same sort of color scheme, you use like the red, white, and black colors um, in your last images. Um, I think maybe I just noticed because it was at the same sort of color scheme that I'm interested in. Um, and I think they're quite powerful colors. And I wondered if if it was intentional that you used those, or I know you sort of said that it was you kind of went and started. You, it was quite like an instinctive process when you were writing on the wall and um, and you also used tape as well. And I also used tape in my thing and it was also quite instinctive. Like I just had to grab materials and hope for the best. So yeah, I wondered if, if it was intentional or if you'd sort of planned it. Um, yeah, it, it was intentional. And I think um, uh, the similarities in our color palette is one of the reasons why I was really drawn to the aesthetic of your work, like your images, um, and, and, you know, especially your sketchbook page where you've placed your contact sheets. It's like, if you go on my Pinterest, it's just what I've saved. It, it, my pins are just all about, all about like what you've actually done in your sketchbooks. I was really drawn to the um, color palette of your work, really, really drawn. And also the, it is intentional because I, the, like I, I actually, I only have black, white and red clothes. So I only had a red scarf and I only wear black. So I was basically just working with myself and I, 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 I just kind of am this color palette. So, and I just, yeah, there's just really powerful color. I think, you know, red has such a powerful sort of history um, of like, you know, anarchy, but also political kind of symbol. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I agree. Yeah, no, I and yeah, and the red fabric as well. There's like so yeah. many similarities. Yeah, that 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 is an incredible, incredible photograph. Um, the one where there's a, a red fabric on on the snow. Um, it, it it looks like a film still. Uh, from the remnant, I think there is a scene where you have like blood on snow, and that's exactly what it takes me to. Um, that that image. So yeah, that yeah, there, there's there's so many parts of your work that I was drawn to. Okay, oh, thank you. And yours as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's great, thank you guys. Um, first of all, I've just got some comments, observations, and then we'll go on to 
um, think of questions for people. Uh, Maura Gramsay says, Kirsty's work makes me think of absence. As a historian, I can't help thinking of the clearances. Um, this one I think is for Joel. Interesting to see an issue of global importance focused on through consideration of its impact on a city of such beauty. And Isolt says, great presentations, everyone. Thank you. So um, I will go to straight questions for people. So I just have to scroll up here. Um, so a question for Kirsty, first of all, uh, from Paul Curry. Your work is quite poignant. Could it be said the, to represent the way parts of the Highlands are quietly being taken back by nature? That's a good question. I think it kind of fits in with the, actually the comment about the clearances, like there's lots of issues I would say that are very like independent to the Highlands, like just with like geographic and the landscape. I've actually been looking into, I found this really interesting resource, like all about um, sort of like about the witch trials in the 17th century, kind of end, start of the 17th century, kind of end of the 16th century and I was reading of how it kind of differed throughout Scotland so when you think of witch trials you think of kind of like Edinburgh and all the trials there where it was actually very differently handled in the Highlands because I feel like we were more accepting of the old ways and so kind of within that it has the feeling that like you have these sort of very distinct cultures throughout Scotland like there is a big difference between like the Highlands and the Lowlands and obviously there's like pros and cons of lots of them but I think kind of sticking with my upbringing in the Highlands is something I'd really like to explore and kind of root my practice in so once I can drive and like travel up to the Highlands more often as well once lockdown has kind of loosened I'd really like to focus on like the kind of historical side as well and I think I would agree with that comment that a lot of especially with kind of natives to the Highland, kind of with the tourist industry kind of growing as it always has, they're sort of losing the sort of like kind of Highland kind of culture to it within this kind of rise of tourism, if that makes sense. <laughs> I hope you get what I'm meaning with that. Okay, thank you very much, Christy. Um, I have two questions here um, for Kea. Uh, first of all, um, how political would you say your work is, if at all? I'll let you answer that first and I'll, I'll ask the next one. Um, that's a good question, thank you. Um, I think that my work is very socially and politically charged, I would say. Uh, I like to kind of think that there may be in a dialogue where it's a bit of tug and war, um, you know, like the subtle kind of everyday um, social issues fighting over the kind of everyday political issues um, and you know my general practice um, the kind of archive and the everyday in sight of a working class home like the whole idea of that came from you know communities living through austerity so that's really politically charged whereas you know if you can create your own archive uh, you can create your own cultural um, kind of heritage and access um, at home and I thought that that was really you know prevalent when institutions aren't available to certain communities um, and it was something that ended up being even more prevalent when we went into lockdown and nobody had access to these so it's quite an interesting conversation uh, and question to come up I think when we come out of all the lockdowns um, hopefully soon. <laughs> Thank you. Um the second part of the question was from Alicia Bruce, and she asks, um, have you seen Eva Mare's amazing, amazing project, Hilly Drone? She covered all the no ball game signs uh, with hearts on Valentine's Day. Um, good to know that they will be a thing of the past and you're highlighting them, that they are still there. Um, no, I've not actually. It's one of those things that when you are kind of documenting like the everyday, you know, it's it's not going to be something that's new. <laughs> uh, that it's not going to be some. It is definitely going to be something that's done before. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's quite nice just to go into it in your own your own kind of 
path with your own idea but I'll definitely look them up that sounds uh, sounds really interesting and I agree I'm, I'm glad that it's going to be a thing of a past and uh, I do agree with the uh, play st strategy that they are anti-play not that it ever stopped many of us. <laughs> Great thank you and um, this one is for Joe um, from Alan Kelly um, he asks how does flying to Venice square with documenting anthropological change to the natural environment? Sorry, can you repeat that again? Sorry, um, I'll say a bit clearer. How does flying to Venice square with documenting anthropological change to the natural environment? I think is he I think I think I see what he's asking. That is a good question. Um, I think uh, that is that is the one hypocrisy within the project. I think this is what you're saying is that because I'm flying, it's obviously climate change, and there's obviously a direct link there, um, and that's one hypocrisy within the project. But the reason that I flew there was because the pro the event that was happening there and then was happening there, and then I had to get there as quick as quickly as possible because if I did get a train or whatever, then I would have been, I would have got there in like five days and I would have missed it. So um going into continuing the project uh and traveling to to venice I've, I've i've looked up and i will be i will be traveling there with in more environmental uh means but at that time when i had to go there i had to fly because if i'd gone there another way then i wouldn't have got there in time i hope that answers the question yeah wonderful um, so I'm just going to ask um, some questions for everybody. Um, so if you want to just jump in. Um, first of all, how will you know when you have found your voice? <laughs> and I want to take that away. It's quite a hard one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, didn't hear the, I didn't hear the question. Can you say it again? Oh, sorry. Um, how will you know when you have found your voice? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Um, I think that that's a really interesting question to ask uh, photographers and, and artists because obviously we're also visual and voices sound. But yeah, I think um, finding your voice and finding your voice within art is kind of just looking at what you really appreciate and what you really appreciate in life and what you love and um, what attracts your eye specifically to what you're taking photographs of. Everyone has different eyes and everyone likes different things and everyone enjoys different things, different things as well obviously and um everyone's from different cultures and from different backgrounds and so i believe personally that yeah photography is a great way of people showing their voice because it is you're literally stopping time on a piece of paper you're literally stopping a moment happening and i feel like that's speak and it is the whole the whole phrase of an image speaks louder than words and uh what's it a thousand what's the saying <laughs> um an image, yeah, the image speaks a thousand words. And so, yeah, I think photography especially, yeah, is a great way of showing your voice. Yeah. I think for me, um, this is going to be a continuation of maybe not finding my voice. Um, I kind of want to master the amateur, and I've said this before in other, other things as well, so it's maybe been heard. Maybe that is the voice. I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, it's this this idea of, you know, the kind of underrepresented amateur photographer and like I don't try really hard. <laughs> I just want to to take a photo and uh, I think that's quite important to encourage other people that, you know, we might have graduated in photo uh, and doing photography at the same time. Um, but yeah this kind of idea of the amateur is quite important as well. I think um, with myself, I find that um, it's over time, you find your voice, I think as well, because it's, um, I find myself going back to the same things or very similar things. And I didn't know a few years ago what I'm, truly interested in what I find interesting and what I want to tell a story on or um and what I want to depict through my work and um I think it just kind of comes through just carrying on working and experimenting and just 
working through and just loving what you're doing. And it just takes time, I think. And um, yeah, I can see a pattern in my own work. No, I would say, I guess. Is that you? Hmm? I, um, I didn't hear you there, just keep going, apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say just, I think like one of the good things about leaving it, like as much as I love like art school is that you get to work very like authentically with yourself, like without like deadlines and um, kind of like almost the restrictions of uni. So like really just finding like the kind of work that you want to make and like what feels definitely the most you, like even like without sort of, like I say like success is like very relative, which is just as long as you're kind of working and like the way that you feel is most natural to you and like creating the content that goes with that, I would say. Um, I think I'm probably on the same page as Kaya. Um, I think it is, uh, for me, it is personally a, 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 a continuous process of not finding your voice <laughs> or maybe that just happens um, because I think um, it's sort of difficult to be, um, or I find it difficult to uh, adhere myself to certain views because I think that as I will grow, then I will change. And so will my perspectives on those views. And so I think it's very um, difficult to uh, stabilize uh, something that's constantly changing. Um, but it would be interesting to come to terms with that constant change. And I think that that would be like a way of defining my voice. Yeah, I kind of agree as well with that. Like I think the word voice, finding a voice implies that your photography needs to be heard in order for it to be important. And I don't think that's always the case. I think as long as you're work, making work that's intrinsically important to you, eventually like it, you know, like I think that's how you should make work without trying to make it be heard. You should be kind of making it because it's something you care about. And like naturally I think people will also care and yeah I don't think it's I think it's important as well not to get too stuck into a certain like way of working or a certain theme it's I think as like I mean as a, I think I class myself as a designer as well as an artist and like it's important to be open to working in new ways and and not necessarily having like a very narrow kind of voice if you like yeah it's, it's important to be open to change and and new ways of working. I get the question now. <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, it's kind of images, well, it's the whole kind of uh, debate about like truth and how an image can kind of translate truth and how that's subjective to whoever's kind of seeing it and, and, and the debate that photography creates around that. Um, but then again, at the end of the day, I'm really bad at talking. So I kind of just hope, hope that my images can speak for themselves. And then I'll try and uh, ramble about something afterwards and hope that contextualizes them. But yeah, I think finding your voice as a, like, as a photographer it is, is almost like what's been said. It's, it's an organic process. And not, I think it's better to not put too much pressure on yourself when you're kind of developing your craft because when you look back on like the trail of what, where, how you've got from A to B, it seems so much more like it makes so much more sense. Whereas when you're in the moment, it's like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> um, but yeah, just try, just try and enjoy it. Um, yeah. Um, I've got one more um, question before we wrap up and it's from Alicia Bruce. Uh, first of all, she says that she's impressed with like how people are, or graduates are sharing their work um, in response to restrictions. Um, she asks, how do you see photo graduates this year, especially meeting a wider global audience? Do you find more urgency in terms of getting your work further out there as venues were closed? And what have you done differently that you may that you may have done without lockdown? I think pers personally, I think um, it's, it, when coronavirus first happened, it was kind of a, like, feeling this general feeling of like feeling uninspired and not really knowing what to do and then it kind of turned into a lot of well groups and artists 
uh, initiatives kind of came together and made more opportunities for people which might not have had the opportunities before. Uh, like, and student led ones as well, like SADGRAS, another shout out, um, and kind of giving people platforms um, that might not have had it in the first place because of what's happened. So I, in a weird way, I found more opportunities in the circumstances than they might have been before. But I don't know if that's just because I was more aware of them because I was sitting in my room looking at the internet every day and looking for the opportunities, whereas I might have been in at, at uni stressing about running around like a headless chicken, trying to get ready for the degree show. So I think it's more, yeah, I think, I think it's, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, but after that, I don't know how, I think people were probably really yearning to have physical exhibitions again so i think hopefully in not too distant future that will be able to happen again yeah i would i very much agree with that actually because i think it i got a whole lot of because everyone was kind of had the same fear that they were going to miss out on like loads of like opportunities for like physical degree show that sort of like so much momentum was put into like Instagram accounts like sad grads and like online exhibitions and I think in a good way it's really sort of pushed forward like inclusivity and like exhibitions as well because people have realized that you can create a good exhibition virtually and even if like we did go back to like physical exhibitions there's always going to have like we can create a virtual one as well to like be really inclusive to like people like can't go and visit ex physical exhibitions or even they're just like away at the time so they can't like travel and see it as well. So I think it's had like kind of a good impact in that way. But of course, I think I would kind of without a degree show, I do kind of lack the skills in <laughs> installation, <laughs> which I hope I'll need in the future. So there is that. But um, yeah, so I would definitely agree with you there, Joe. <laughs> Any other comments? If not, you can you can wrap things up if you like. Yeah, um, well, I guess I can't, I don't know if this answers the question at all, but I was very surprised by how much like effect the digital world can have on your work. Like, I think, cause I've never, I've always been like such a believer in like physical work. None of my work has ever really been that digital. But then having to, having to like transfer and all of the kind of, I've, I guess I feel really lucky that so many opportunities have come out of it, which I never would have probably have done unless it was locked down. Um, but then on the flip side of that, like I just, I really miss exhibitions. And I think while all these online things are great for like networking and getting contacts and opportunities, it just it will never replace having like a physical exhibition and being able to, see a piece of work in the flesh uh, so I think it's probably emphasized how important that experience is over anything digital. I think due to the nature of my work um, in lockdown as well not just like the kind of social presence but the publications and things that were coming out were really important. I found myself collecting more um, photo books and publications than ever and artist books because yeah like we just like kind of like yearn for that that contact with art that's almost a physical presence and that is the closest that you can get and I think it's really nice to have that kind of like um almost you know kind of presented museum exhibited piece in the comfort of your home as well um where it feels quite intimate as well um whereas it's not completely digital um so that those those people also maybe it's Good to be plugged for uh, saying to look out for the future proof publication that's coming out next year too. Um, yeah, um, with degree shows not happening and everything this year, it's yeah, it's a, ma a major, major kick in the teeth. I mean, I, as I know from from Glasgow School of Art, everyone was ready for this for their whole four years of study, and we were all ready. We all had big plans. We all had ideas for it. Um, we all wanted to do a physical show like we all physically you need to see you will need to see art you need to get out of the house and look at art and actually appreciate the textures and the colors and everything in real life and yeah we all had big plans I, I even had big big plans I even bloom and bought 
uh, red, yellow, and blue boiler suits for my degree helpers to wear. Oh. So we'd all be like in it together and everything. But um, yeah, no, in a way, it's a massive shame because I feel like it's, it's something, especially our year, really, really suffered from big time, of course. Like it was something we were promised even in our interview in the open day that at the end of the four years, you would be getting a degree show. And it's something that I don't know about your unis, but I haven't heard anything that's going to be happening or any sign of anything, unfortunately. So, but as a counteract of it, thank God for like, pages like sad grads and the degree show simulator big shout out to my flatmate ben for that and everyone that put that together and the way that like instagram kind of saved the day and like online platform kind of saved the day it's mad that now instead of making work for the gallery we're now having to make work for the internet and for instagram which is something i never thought we'd ever be having to do i thought we'd be doing physical shows for a while but it seems like art is kind of art platforms especially have kind of flipped on their head and kind of turned around and been like, look, these social media platforms are great. People can view them anywhere in the world at any time in the world. And these things can still be happening. Um, yeah, it's just a massive, massive shame. But at the same time, I feel like, yeah, we're, it's clearly shown that us as artists have still taken, what, taken what's the left of the crumminess of this year and still turned it on its head and still pushed forward and tried to make proper things happen. Um, which just makes me even prouder to be a sad grad and even more proud to be a class of 2020. Because, yeah, we're, we're never going to... No one has ever seen anything like this before. No one has, you know? And the way we've been able to twist it on his head and kind of make it work is really just showing, like, how creative us creatives are, I guess. I don't know. That's, that's my two cents on it, at least. I think yeah. I'm going to um, agree with uh, you, Alex. Um, I think I, I was just talking to uh, to someone about this, and um, you know, yeah, COVID has like there's so many things bad about it, and we've all missed our uh, degree shows um, and all the exciting things that we planned, especially like the sculpture students. I mean, how do you even like photographs can be experienced digitally, but how do you translate a sculpture into a digital realm? So, I mean, as photographers, I think we're still quite quite privileged in that sense but I think what I think what's really amazing about about this uh this pandemic is the way that that really humankind has mobilized at such a such a fast pace and it's not just you know it's not just creators but really we've got we every person there were hospitals up in so many countries and in like within a month which is based which was not possible in in the pandemics that have come uh, before and I think I think that's really powerful and really inspiring and I just um, yeah I, I'm really I know it's been very difficult for us, for everyone I think you know we I think we, we will come out of it really strong having learned so much and um, it's it's been a really really great learning experience a painful one though but that's what all learning experiences are like <laughs> Um, I'm just going to wrap things up now and um, thank everyone for joining us. Um, and the artists, uh, thank you for the insightful talks. Uh, the work is really, really strong this year for Future Proof. And um, although we haven't seen them in the flesh, I think you've done an amazing job like presenting them to uh, the audience. Um, and I think everyone is going to be looking forward to seeing what you all do next. Um, and on that note, we'll say goodbye and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Big loves. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.